Welcome back. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. My name's Brendan Cole. Now, 10 years ago last week, more than one million people gathered in Hyde Park for the biggest demonstration in British history. Many more marched through the streets of London opposing military intervention in Iraq. Such an emotional outpouring was matched internationally over a period of several months, and some 36 million people across the globe took part in almost 3,000 protests against the war. Ten years on, and a post-Saddam Iraq is still dealing with the fallout from the invasion. However, the capture and killing of Saddam Hussein gave people of the country a chance to confront the man who had terrorised them for so long. But the case for war made by Tony Blair and George Bush was widely discredited, and the expression sexed up, which described the dossier for war, now part of our lexicon. But what of Iraq today? There is democracy, but an ongoing insurgency continues to rage. Well, to discuss this, 10 years on, I'm joined in the studio by Kate Hudson, who's General Secretary of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. Also here in the studio is Saeed Ali Alavi, who's a Middle Eastern analyst at the School of Oriental and African Studies. Also joining joining me in the studio is Professor Saeed Jawad. He's an Iraqi political scientist who was in Baghdad at the time of the invasion, and he is a senior visiting fellow at the London School of Economics. And on the line from Baghdad, we're joined by Mohammed Ali Harisi, who's the deputy bureau chief of Agence France Presse. Ten years on, Kate Hudson, what were your impressions of that day? What was the mood then, and what were you hoping to achieve? Well, the million or so people there, Brendan, were hoping to persuade our government not to go to war on the basis of a series of lies which have subsequently been exposed as such and accepted as such. It was a a massive outpouring of opposition to war, but also a very, very strong uh, criticism of the government's sort of lies and immoral approach to that whole issue. I think as well as trying to stop the war in Iraq, it was also a, a kind of demand for a new morality in British politics as well. So I think it was it was quite a complex set of emotions. But above all, it was a democratic outpouring, an expression of the popular view and a very powerful mood for peace. But as a democratic outpouring, do you think it was in vain, given that it didn't make any difference in terms of the British government's stance and what they were going to do? I don't think expression of the popular will is ever in vain. I mean, you might as well say, well, there's no point in having a political opposition. You know, if you don't win, there's no point in being in the game. I think it's had a very important and probably long-term impact on British politics. I think it's shown quite clearly and systematically that the majority of the British population is not a gung-ho pro-war population. I think we've seen systematically since then that the majority of the population has opposed British wars and interventions in the Middle East. It's systematically opposed to nuclear weapons now and the replacement of nuclear weapons. So I think it's he- it's changed the terms of the debate around British foreign and defence policy. Professor Saad Jawad, you were in Baghdad at the time. Did you get a sense of this outpouring of emotion that was happening across the world? Well, certainly it was a mixed feeling about what was going abroad internationally. But uh, the fact is that they were so much disappointed to find that all these demonstrations did not achieve anything. And the United States and Britain went on with the aggression and the, the occupation of Iraq without any legal permission from the United Nations. And I think the legacy after 10 years is quite clear. The more important thing is there was no legal action taken against those who lied about what was going on in Iraq and who lied about the Iraqi situation like Mr. Blair and Mr. Bush and Mr. Colin Powell and Mr. Ramsfield and others. And they are still free to go and they are still free to lie about these things. For example, in the Shell Corps Committee, Mr. Blair came and repeated the same lies uh, with arrogance and did not even give any apology about what he done to the Iraqis. The Iraqis were disappointed by this example of Western democracy. I should think the millions who came out should have at least deterred the two countries, the United States and Britain, from taking such an action, especially when the rulers were well sure of the sort of fabricated reasons they have produced to invade Iraq. 
Said Alavi, the point there is, is made very clearly. Tony Blair, the Prime Minister at the time, very much talked about um, the moral case for war. Do you think that his feeling that the moral case for war was strong, even if the legal case wasn't necessarily? That is a matter that needs to be debated and very questionable. But 10 years later, the legacy of Iraq war remains vague, unclear, and many believe disastrous. I mean, Mr. Tony Blair, for instance, let me to put this. The legacy is like a coin. It has two sides. One side is mainly interpreted by optimists. That side tells us some idealistic and utopian stories. For instance, the Iraq war may result in disposing, which did, disposing the Ba'athist tyrannical regime, the regime that gassed the Iraqi town of Halabja in 1988, the regime that invaded its neighbors, Iran and Kuwait, and that was the rationale behind it, uh, in order to somehow, say, manipulate the public opinion to accept and also to justify that war. Sajawad, given the legal debate and the framework of the legal debate, I mean, Tony Blair himself was flush with the successes of Kosovo, Sierra Leone, you could argue, uh, in terms of intervention and Western intervention. Do you not believe that he felt... Uh, that it was the right thing to do. I think, you know, if you look into the Iraq situation, Iraq was subjected to over 13 years of sanctions, deadly sanctions, inhuman sanctions, and these sanctions were enough to weaken the Iraqi regime. More than that, Americans and the British, at least in three times, attacked Iraq militarily in the 90s in order to so-called destroy Iraqi's ability to uh, establish nuclear or to have weapons of mass destruction. The second thing is who gives a ruler the right to decide what he is doing is moral or immoral? I mean, is it to decide it, to be decided by himself? Mr. Blair says this is a moral action I should take? Or is it the international community or the United Nations that should say that this is a legal and a must-do action in any part of the world. This is what happened in 1991. So, but nobody objected about the actions of the Allied forces in 1991 when they forced Saddam Hussein to go out of Kuwait. But in 19, in 2003, there was nothing like that happening. The only thing they wanted is they wanted to destroy this country. The lives the Iraqis have uh, have lost. The, the destruction of the infrastructure of the state in 2003. Nothing was done to rebuild the, this infrastructure. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. We're discussing the Iraq war 10 years on. With me is Kate Hudson, General Secretary of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, Said Ali Alavi, a Middle Eastern analyst at the School of Oriental and African Studies, Professor Saad Jawad, who is Senior Visiting Fellow at the London School of Economics. And on the line from Baghdad, we're joined by Mohammed Ali Aharisi, who's the Deputy Bureau Chief of Agence France Presse. But on the point of sanctions which you raise, was th th those were United Nations sanctions, and they hit the Iraqi people far more than they hit the regime. So that's a shortcoming of the United Nations' ability to deal with, t with a tyrant such as Saddam Hussein, rather than... Tony Blair's invasion, perhaps. It was forced by the United Na by United States and Britain. And I should tell you that these sanctions that were imposed were so cynical and deadly on the Iraqi people that nobody could accept them, But and we couldn't do anything in, uh, in order to remove them. You see what I mean? So it was done by the United Na States and the United Kingdom. It was not done by the United Nations. But was there any sense that those sanctions would eventually have some kind of impact on the regime? Well, they shouldn't have been imposed in the first place. There are other means in order to weaken a regime. But to impose these sanctions on the people and to make Iraq lose 1,800,000 people, most of them children and women, uh, was a deadly action that should not have been imposed in the first place. Kate Hudson, can I get your reaction to that? Well, you seem to be talking as though somehow it, it's OK, or well, Tony Blair has some kind of moral view that the regime needs to be changed, and therefore it's OK, and, and it's OK for another country to decide it can go in and dispose of a, another country's ruler. Under international law, wars for regime change are illegal. 
illegal. You know, and until and unless and until the United Nations decides to change that, it is absolutely against the law. In fact, at the time, Tony Blair was not saying we have a moral responsibility to go and save the Iraqi people from their tyrant. He was arguing that in the context of the war on terror, it was necessary to disarm Iraq because in but 45 he, but, minutes they could they could attack Britain. All that was complete lies. And there was no problem of al-Qaeda in Iraq before the invasion by the US and the UK. CND and others did make strenuous attempts to bring a legal case uh, against Tony Blair and the other people in the cabinet at that time responsible for uh, taking Britain to war. That went to um, the International Criminal Court and the uh, prosecutor said, yes, there is a case to answer, but we're not going to take it forward because there are other more pressing issues. You know, and I think it's uh, deeply regrettable that where there is a clear case of war crimes charges to be brought, um, that has not actually yet taken place. But it's uh, one of the great achievements of the movement here that Tony Blair has not yet been rehabilitated in British politics and wherever he pops up in Britain, there is a protest against him to prevent him trying to uh, pose himself as a reasonable human being. But on the, on the point of the moral case, he did actually say the moral case against war has a moral answer. Um, it's not the reason we act, no. but he was referring to the United Nations mandate on weapons of mass destruction. I know you referred to the dodgy there, dossier. There, and, there were, there were no, but the United Nations Security no Resolution 1441 there. did demand that Iraq give cooperation with the UN and IAEA inspections, and, and Saddam and refused did. to do that. No, that's not true. They did. They were disarmed with whatever uh, chemical and biological weapons they may have had. They were disarmed during the 1990s. At the time of the war, two months before our government went to war, Hans Blix, the chief weapons inspector, uh, said there is no evidence there. Give us a few more weeks just to finally check everything. But they didn't want to give him time to finally check everything because they wanted to use it as an excuse. So it was utterly duplicitous. And the UN weapons inspectors had done a fantastic job with uh, Iraqi cooperation. But isn't the, isn't the issue that um, after his invasion of Kuwait, it was left to fester for too long and he should have been removed after his invasion of Kuwait, well, which was it, backed no, by the it's, UN. It's for the Iraqi people to remove him if they wanted to remove him. It's not for Britain. When the, when the weapons inspectors had done their job throughout the 1990s, and as has been mentioned by colleagues, terrible uh, suffering caused by those sanctions, uh, it was not for Britain and the United States then to fabricate another whole series of charges without any basis in the truth whatsoever. Uh, back to you, Sir Jawad. Do you think that Saddam Hussein would have eventually been removed and we should have waited? Certainly, certainly. To start with, after Kuwait, there was a very big uprising. And the factor that kept Saddam Hussein in power was the actions taken by the Allied forces to allow him to use his forces against these popular uprisings. So they were helping him to stay in power. Their only concern was to remove him or to get him out of Kuwait. This is the first thing. So they did not take any action against that. The second thing is, my problem is, it's not only with Mr. Blair or Mr. Bush. My real problem is with these respected media, uh, especially the press, the British and the American respected press like The Guardian, The Times, The New York Times, The Washington Post and all these respected journals, they were part of the lies that they were spread and nobody is even... Uh, indicting them or asking them why did they why did you lie about these things the BBC as well this is the second problem the third problem is now you can see that all over the Arab world tyrants were removed by popular action why did didn't the United States and the others wait for Saddam Hussein to have the same future or this destiny as, as Hosni Mubarak, as Gaddafi. These movements should come from the people themselves. Any attempt to change any regime should be coming from the country itself, not to be imposed by powers, foreign powers for agendas which are not the agendas of the people. The American and the British agenda were not. They were going there for oil. They were going there to, to, to support or to preserve the security of Israel. They were going there to... So you see it as a, you see it as a big um, conspiracy from 
not only the British government but also the British media Just in terms yeah, of pursuing yeah, global yeah, interests. Yeah, yeah. But, the, but the BBC, the, but well the BBC itself, the BBC <laughs> itself revealed the story about the dodgy dossier, the so-called dodgy when? dossier. When? 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 It was on the Today program. Yeah, I know. When? After ten years? After thirteen years? At the time of the dossier, there were very much uh, 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 clear evidence that they were fabricated. But it's difficult to uh, no, it's not difficult. collusion no, with the, no, no, with no, the no, BBC the, the, and uh, the British listen, government. Listen, the CIA. M- MI15, oh, uh, MI5, sorry, and the, uh, the, the German uh, intelligence service, all of them now, they are saying that we have used uh, words and uh, revelations by Iraqi expatriates who were lying to us in order to get permanent residency or nationality to stay in our country. They were lying about these things. Nobody, va- and people like uh, Akios, like Butler, like Mr. Hans Bilix, all of them did not say clear cut truth that there was they did not find any weapons of mass destruction. Can I bring in Mohammed Ali Harisi who is the Deputy Bureau Chief of Agence France Presse in Iraq at the moment. Um, we know that there have been uh, certain demonstrations and uh, against the current uh, Iraqi leader. I mean, what's the situation on the ground there like at the moment? Well, uh, all I can say is that the situation is really like sad 10 years after the war. You know, Iraq is when they uh, open the door to go out from their apartment. They feel like they are walking in a minefield. And the, 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 the mines are not only the security, which consists of like car bombs and suicide attacks and, and this kind of security uh, issues. It's like also like uh, corruption and like uh, the absence of really essential stuff like electricity and clean water. And also it's like uh, some, something else like the regime that was installed after the war, which we are seeing now all the protests now, for example, against the government are guided by sectarian, uh, secta- are, are based on sectarian basis, you know, just like Sunni against the Shia or mm-hmm. Christian or Kurd. So the, 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 the regime that was installed after the war is based on, on sectarian quotas, just like the same case in Lebanon, you know, the parliament is divided between Muslims and Christians. And now here they, they, they distribute the, the, the post, the positions, like the prime minister should be Shia, the head of parliament, should, the speaker should be Sunni, the president should, should be Kurdish. So they, they build the country on a sectarian, sectarian uh, vision. You know, and it's really sad because you feel like the people are are really moving back backwards and not moving forward at all. And on that point, um, uh, Rend Al Rahim, who's the former Iraqi ambassador to the United States, wrote in the Observer that what is actually holding Iraq back today is this continued internal strife, which you're referring to. But she made the point that not since the worst days of the Shia Sunni warfare in 2006 to 2008 has sectarian polarization in Iraq presented such a threat to the country's integrity. Would you agree with that? Absolutely, but I would say that the years between 2006 and 2008 were really rough and tough, and it was a bloodshed, and it continues, not at the same level, of course, but what's happening now, you feel like it could trigger this again at any moment. So it's really dangerous, you know, and you know that Iraq is a big country, and it's not like uh, other countries in the region, like Lebanon, for example, and you have a big number of Shia and Sunni, and at any moment you can go into another big clash, another big sectarian war. So the situation is really like they're living on the edge, you know, it's really, really dangerous. Um, Said Ali Alavi, do you think that what we're seeing is, is, is the bringing forward of long-held grievances uh, between the Shias um, who have come to power against minority Sunnis who, who have dominated them? In order to judge, we need to first see the result of the war, that there were... Uh, promising will be very positive. The Iraq will cause total destruction of Iraq's civil infrastructure. The rise of bloody sectarian tensions is a clear result of Iraq war. The war caused Iraq to become a playground for Al-Qaeda-inspired fanatics who previously had no mandate in Iraq and has created instability in the region. Hundreds of thousands of lives are lost and we have uh, conflicting figures, but figures are not important. What is important is the lives of innocent civilians were lost. A significant number of Iraqis are still displaced internally and forced into exile since 2003. Needless to say that the Abu Ghraib torture scandal traumatized the world and the Iraqi people. Business climate is still dysfunctional, sectarian uh, tension is not easing, 
although <coughs> some may argue that um, economic situation looks more functional in the Kurdish area. Indeed, and you, you refer to Abu Ghraib there, and also we've got other things such as the, the Haditha killings, um, which which resonated around the world. But um, uh, Professor Saad Jawad, I, I would like to get your view on the feeling when you were there with Operation Red Dawn, the capture of Saddam. Here we had a man, he was paraded before the people on television. He had his beard shaved. I mean, what were your feelings when you saw that? I was, I was never a Baathist. I was never a supporter of Saddam Hussein. But I was really sad when I saw the pictures of Saddam Hussein captured. Here is this president of a country, sovereign country, which who is captured by the United States government. These forces did, uh, did not even make any effort to arrest his sons, Oday and Osei. They killed them brutally when they had the ability to capture them and put them on trial. Second thing, the trial was made by the Americans and run by the Americans, although Iraqi faces were sitting there. So all these things uh, breaks or, or, or hurts the pride of any, any Iraqi national. But yes, a lot of people who were harmed by Saddam Hussein were happy to see him in this uh, condition. But I can tell you that the trial and the execution raised his popularity rather than ended his uh, or broke his image. Uh, uh, my understanding and my uh, being an Iraqi and who lived most of my life in Iraq, I think the the, the threat of, of a civil war is very remote and the, the society will not accept to go into such a thing. And we cannot speak about a Shia government and the Sunni opposition, please this make this sure, because the government now has Shias, Sunnis, and Kurds. They were all cooperating with the Americans and who, are, who were all brought by the Americans to rule Iraq, and you have opposition from the Shia and the Sunnis and the Kurds. You see what I mean? So it's not a clear cut like in, 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 in other parts of the world. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Brendan Cole. We're discussing the Iraq War 10 years on with Kate Hudson, Saeed Ali Alavi, Saad Jawad and Muhammad Ali Harisi. Kate Hudson, uh, you made the point that this was, this was imposed from outside, but do you think lessons can be learnt from this fledgling democracy of Iraq that was invaded and perhaps the narrative of the Arab Spring where we're seeing uh, movements of uh, people rising up um, against their rulers? Yeah, I think that the the lesson to be learned is that firstly, we should uh, comply with international law in all things. You know, if we're not, if we don't uh, comply with the law, then what are we? Uh, we've seen the barbaric results, as our colleague mentioned in Abu Ghraib and, and, and so forth, the way in which the Iraqi population has been treated. You know, an incredibly cultured and civilized society has been degraded by uh, illegal Western intervention. Killing people is not a solution to complex regional problems. Killing people is not the solution to a democratic deficit. And above all, people have the right to determine their own future. And for a sovereign country, the, the people of that country has to decide how it wishes to move forward. I think if, if other, other countries wish to engage, um, then they should, for example, have an eye to who they sell arms to. I mean, it's, it's no secret that um, Britain uh, backed Saddam Hussein for a long time and, and armed him and Britain backed both sides in the Iran-Iraq war and so on. You know, we have a, a legacy in, in the Middle East uh, of, of colonialism, of uh, attempting to control other people's resources, not only with regard to Iraq, but Iran as well, over a very long period. And we have to understand that other countries are not our playground. We have no right to intervene in other countries and we have no right to have access to their resources. Diplomatic solutions on on the basis of uh, justice and equality and peace between nations is the only solution. But it doesn't. But but uh, by that rationale, it hasn't. It didn't work in Kosovo. Um, it didn't work. There was no intervention in Rwanda, and we saw what happened there. By that rationale, those would have been let to. To, the situation would have unravelled. Bosnia could have been part of you can't Greater really Serbia. Make, you can't really make a comparison, say, between Rwanda and Iraq. You know, Rwanda, there was a genocide taking place there and, and the international community together under, under law uh, should have worked out the appropriate way of intervening to prevent that genocide taking place and protecting those people. You know, you can't just say it's the same kind of thing. You know, there are different situations where different solutions are required 
required by the international community. Um, I'll turn to you, Muhammad Ali Harisi in Baghdad. Do you have any kind of optimism in the months and years to come that we could see a stable Iraq? Well, I'm afraid that uh, I have to say that I'm not optimistic at all. Maybe Iraq needs like years and years to become like a normal and stable country, not only because of what's happening inside Iraq, but also because of some, maybe some other states, neighboring states in the region, that they fear a strong Iraq, you know. Iraq has oil, has gas, it's a big land with a big population, and also it has a very, very important weapon, which is water. And I'm afraid that even if Iraq decide to, like, if the Iraqi decide to uh, sit together and to build, like, a, a new regime or I don't know what, and to to uh, to forget the past and open new page, I think that there will always be something, like, harassing Iraq, like some other states in the region or... So I think it, it will take a real, a real a long time to, to, to stabilize Iraq, to have a normal country, and especially, especially when it comes to also to security, and corruption. Corruption. Iraq, you know, it's one of the 10. It's on the top 10 list of the most corrupt countries in the world. And you can imagine a country like, like Iraq with a with an annual budget of $100 billion. And it's being compared to countries like Somalia, and which has a budget of like, I don't know, like hundreds of millions. So you can see how, how, how it works now. And I think it needs like years to to heal the wounds and to like uh, to get over the past especially the the bloodshed during the sectarian war between 2006 2008 but uh, in 10 years time Saad Jawad uh, we're 10 years on where do we where do you see the situation in Iraq in another 10 years time when we're talking about the 20th anniversary of the biggest demonstration through the streets of, of the United Kingdom in history well there are two options if the United States and other regional powers like Iran and Saudi Arabia and Kuwait continue to play an active role in Iraqi politics and divide the government and divide Iraqi politics, I think the situation would continue there and Iraq would remain as a weak country. If the United States and Britain decided to help Iraq to establish a good and and strong uh, uh, government, uh, they could succeed, starting by uh, 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 fighting corruption, handing over to the Iraqi go- government uh, uh, expatriates who hold the nationality American, British, and who, who stole the money of Iraq and living in Britain here. This is the first step, helping Iraq to build a, a, a strong army, helping Iraq to establish a good and 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 and. Uh, uh, I should say, effective government. I think we could see something else, but with the situation there, I think. Uh, the, the, the future looked as bleak as the, as the present. Um, and Kate Hudson, 10 years on from these massive demonstrations which were truly historic, do you think, uh, you, could you ever see that kind of agitation ever again in a conflict in the future? Was, that, was there something particularly special about that that uh, made people feel so strongly? I think it was it was quite remarkable because the previous uh, biggest demonstrations had been in the 80s, the CND demonstrations against nuclear weapons, which were obviously something because we were all terrified at the time. This was quite extraordinary because it was not uh, anything that was going to directly affect us in Britain. It was a, a demonstration for a people that we didn't know, that a country that we'd never been to. But it was a, a, a moral outcry um, by the population that war and war on the basis of lies uh, is not acceptable and we did not want to go to war on that basis and I think that that will remain with us, that determination that we're not going to be used in the future as a population to be mobilised to illegal ends to intervene in other countries. Well, sadly, we've run out of time. Thank you very much for joining me. That's Kate Hudson, General Secretary of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. Said Ali Alavi, who's a Middle Eastern analyst at the School of Oriental and African Studies. Professor Saad Jawad, who's a senior visiting fellow at the London School of Economics. And on the line from Baghdad, Mohammed Ali Harisi, who is the Deputy Bureau Chief of Agence France Press. Thank you very much for joining me, Brendan Cole, on The Voice of Russia.